number you have, I need you to add the two digits together. It's a single uh, digit, leave it as it is. Subtract five, okay? With the number you have left, correlate that with the letter of the alphabet. So one is A, two is B, three is C, and so on. With the letter that you now have, think of the first country that pops into your head. First one, with the last letter in the name of that country, pick an animal. And with the last letter in the name of that animal, pick a color. How many of you are thinking of an orange kangaroo in Denmark? Oh my god! Whoa. <laughs> I'll let you suss that one out. I'm still trying to come up with a color that starts with A. I know some of you didn't, but a lot of you probably did. Can we talk now? You can talk now. <laughs> <laughs> a koala. Yeah. What color starts with A? I had koala. Okay. You end up with like aquamarine koala. Well, that's a good color. Or a <laughs> um, fun icebreaker. Yeah. It's not actually. <laughs> Today we're going to be talking about planning uh, agroforestry. I'm Matt. Uh, I am a, currently a graduate student at the University of Illinois until um, Friday. I defend on my drive back, actually. Um, so wish me luck. <laughs> uh, this, uh, this guide is actually part of my thesis. So uh, we, in our lab, I'm in Sarah Taylor Level's lab, who was on the panel yesterday. And uh, you know, we've done a lot of different, uh, I guess, inquiries onto what farmers need to be successful. And one of the big questions one of the big needs is, is good information. There's a lot of good stuff out there, but we need more. So we decided that uh, part of my thesis would be to come up with this field guide that I'm going to be presenting the first half of today. Um, it's called Perennial Pathways, and if you don't have a copy, come grab one. This is actually just the draft. It's mostly there, but there are probably still some typos, and um, we're too cheap to print colored drafts for you guys, so you get black and white. Um, it's going to be free online as a PDF through the Savannah Institute once it's finished. Um, and uh, there will be two parts. So today is going to be the first part, which is planning. And the second part is establishment. So we're focusing on the first three years, uh, which is kind of the establishment phase of trees. Once you get them through about that three, four, or five year time, uh, they can hang tough and, and they don't need quite as much care. So uh, we'll be talking about planning today. The second half of the book, which you don't have, you only have the first half, is uh, the actual doing of stuff. So planting the trees, uh, uh, propagating, if you're interested in that, uh, weed control, pest control, all that stuff. So my work was supported by the USDA through hatch funds. I feel really fortunate to have been able to spend the last two years uh, studying something that I'm really interested in and learning about it. And it's awesome. So, that's basically what I just said. And here's kind of the steps we'll be going through today. So at any time, you know, I am certain that there are people in this room that know way more about this stuff than I do. So, um, call me out, ask questions, let's make this a collaborative thing. The roots are getting dry. The roots are getting dry, yeah. Uh, they actually do have gel on them, but you can't see it. Uh, so yeah, we'll be going through site evaluation, uh, basically how to select tree and shrub species. We're not going to go into the details there, although you do have some crop profiles in your guide here. We're going to talk a little bit about livestock, harvesting and processing, incorporating your goals as a farmer, and then we're going to put it all together into a design. This is my farm. Uh, I'm a small farmer in Kentucky. <coughs> Excuse me, this is one of our fields that I haven't done anything with yet. Um, I'm in the outer bluegrass, so it's mostly cattle farms around us. As you can see, there's some topography. I've got a 100-foot elevation change from my house to the top of the hill, that hill. And uh, as we work along today, um, we're just going to walk through kind of some of the planning process that I went through to think about what I want to put in this field, and hopefully it'll be useful. So you're going to want to gather a few things as you start to plan. You're going to want some maps, and uh, a good aerial photograph is going to be really important. So you can just get it on Google Maps, and um, I'm hopefully, you know, technology is probably going to fail me here, but um, I'm going to do just a couple of quick demos. If you're not familiar with, um, oops, 
Google Maps is one of the simplest ways to get an aerial photograph. And they're, um, they've now made it so that you can actually measure uh, distances and area in the field on the map, if you haven't seen that. <coughs> Perfect. OK, so this is actually in a browser. This is the same field that I was talking about, right here in the middle. And I'm not going to take a lot of time on this, but because um, you all know how to use Google Maps, but I just wanted to show you this cool feature. If you right click and you say measure distance, and then you just kind of click around the perimeter of your field, um, this is really useful for, uh, like, if you're going to do a fence. But also, if you enclose it, it'll give you the total area. You're going to have to convert that to acres. Um, that's in square feet. So who's a superstar who knows how many square feet are in an acre? 43,560. So this field is about, I didn't actually do a, a very good, clean line. It's about two and a half acres. So super useful if you're just looking at a property and you want to kind of see how big that is. Uh, we'll plug you the Perfect. Yeah, and I am not a savvy smartphone user, so there's probably stuff out there that. Um, so please. Keep. You can also tell you where you are. You can walk the line and figure out what you're walking. Nice. Yeah, I have no cell service in my. Yeah, yeah. All right. Good check. Okay. Um. Cool. Uh, so Google Earth is another uh, good way to get a map. It's a little bit more robust than the kind of browser version. <clears throat> the one that you probably want to get is actually the standalone downloadable version, not the new Chrome version that they just came out with. And um, they're both free. So the same field, but you can actually um, outline polygons, they call them, right? You can add uh, titles. You, you can get a... a you can adjust the scale bar so you can work with that. So you can create a pretty simple map just uh, by you know, doing a screenshot on your browser and using something like paint and, and cropping it. Um, there's another, OK, so aerial photographs. The next thing you need is a good soil map. You need to understand what's going on under, underground and with your soils. Um, I promise I only have three of these demos, so it's not going to be like copy as much. Cool. So this is called Soil Web. It's a, a website. And um, I've already pulled up the same field. It's so awesome. You can just click on a point in the field. And I don't know if you can see that little red X. You yep. click on a point, and it'll tell you the soil type where you click. And they do have apps for this on your phone, too, where it'll tell you the soil type where you're standing, which is awesome, too. Um, but embedded in this, this is uh, based on the, the USDA soil maps. You can come over here to um, this map unit data and click that. And it's going to give you some really awesome information about your farmland. So this is not primed farmland. Uh, it's the slope. It'll give you flood frequency, uh, ponding frequency, drainage class, you know, well drained. Really important things to know when you're choosing what species. So um, as you can see, I've got several soil types on my farm. Uh, this is another soil type up here. I, this is a flatter area. And so this is now farmland of statewide importance. Um, so it's pretty cool to be able to just click around and see that. You can actually uh, print this off too. But if you want uh, a more detailed soil map, there's another website uh, called Web Soil Survey. Do you know of any way of getting a site index information from the web? You're talking about like, uh, like for, he asked about site index for tree sites. Yes. Um, <coughs> you can actually do that in both of the apps I just, in Soil Web, if you click down through those menus, if the data exists for that area, it'll be there. Um, in Web Soil Survey, which um, is another, it's another uh, website. This, it's a little clunkier to learn how to use, but it's a bit more robust. They use the same data set. Um, this is the G-Sergo soil data um, maps that the USDA developed. Um, this, this is a map that you can print off of a web total survey once you like, kind of 
figured out how to do it. So this is obviously a little bit uh, nicer with the actual soil profiles. And, um, and then in Web Soil Survey, you can actually print out a detailed soil uh, like description. It ends up as a really nice packet that has all the descriptions of no site. It can include the site index information. Actually, let me show you that. Um, what I'm talking about is in certain areas they've done, they basically run the calculations to figure out um, how fast and how productive trees grow, um, or you know, corn or different crops. I don't have some of that in Kentucky because we don't have, nobody done the numbers for it. But if you go into, um, what is it? So this is a very state by state. A little bit. Like this information is available. The basics will be there for every state. The soil types are already mapped? Yep. 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 Um, yep, yep, yep. Yeah, for sure what Coast Survey does. Um, another thing, I'm glad you actually went into that. So this is a composition which is made up of several different soil types. If you click into uh, the, this, uh, that's not it. Um, the description for the soils, you're going to get some pretty interesting information like mean annual temperature, um, precipitation. If you go down here, uh, it's going to give you use of vegetation. So, you know, description of what it's used for, pasture, hay, and then it'll give you a, uh, native vegetation. So we've got oak, ash, elm, hickory, that's pretty useful to tell too. That's what's associated with that soil type. Um, <coughs> and Tom, I know that they, that they have the data. There are productions on I know on the web soil survey. I can get some time. Yeah, and I, I could I've do seen it. it before. Well, yeah. I know it's yeah. Um, if anybody's interested in that, I can show you how to do it in web soil survey, but it's not a terribly quick thing. That's a good question. The species list there is de facto a site index. Yeah, yeah, by some of the time. So you've got an aerial map, you've got your soil map. The next thing you need to figure out is your history, your field history. <coughs> if you own the farm, um, this is stuff that you'll have. If you've just purchased it, you probably want to ask the, the, the folks you purchased it from what their uh, history has been as far as what they planted, what they've applied. If they've applied pesticides and you're planning on using Herbicides to control weeds, you're going to want to figure out if you have herbicide resistant weeds on your site. If you're planning on being organic, you need at least a three year transition from the last time that you applied a prohibited substance to the first time you plan on harvesting something. Um, and I've uh, been involved in organic agriculture for a long time, so if anybody's interested in figuring out the regs for that, we can talk. And then if you're actually going into an old orchard and you're planting young trees, you can have problems with the buildup of, of pathogens there. They call, call it replant disease. And there's some steps that you probably need to take before you put your young trees in. <coughs> so then we got to talk about climate. Um, rainfall obviously is an important one. We get roughly 45 to 48 inches of rain a year, and it's more or less spread out through the entire year. So unless we have a drought, um, we don't typically have to irrigate. Um, for the trees to survive, but you still have to make a choice about, you know, if there is if there is a drought, is it worth my is it worth irrigating? You know, I love what Tom says: uh, plant things that are worth irrigating, and then irrigate them if they need it, right? So uh, you can use different criteria to decide if you want to irrigate your stuff or not. You're going to want to figure out your hardiness zone. I'm six A where I am. This is not where I am. Uh, this is obviously. Uh, these are shifting a little bit as we have climate change, but um, my gut instinct is go with the colder version because it's just going to be a crapshoot. So, and then you, you need to think about the microclimates on your site. So, uh, ridge tops tend to be pretty windy. Um, so, you know, think about putting in windbreaks or don't put things up there that are super sensitive. And then frost pockets, areas where you have drainage and the cold air. Um, stays down in those frost pockets at night, you're going to want to put things there that don't bloom early. So going back to this, uh, our, our example here, this, this here is a creek, and the hill slopes that way. And so probably the bottom quarter to a third of this 
field would be considered like in a frost pocket. And I can bear that out by experience by walking up the hill to feed sheep. Mm -hmm. When you start to get, you know, 20 feet up the hill, there's a noticeable difference in how cold it is. And then you're, so the, this first part of, of your site assessment is basically stuff you can gather online or from records and stuff. And then you're going to want to actually go out into the field and do uh, some observations and some tests. So a soil test is critical. Um, there are different philosophies on who to use and all that. I'm going to leave that to, to you to figure out. But um, do soil tests and uh, follow the recommendations. You're going to figure things out from walking through the field that you can't figure out from a map. I've got, you know, tabletop sized flagstone in my field. And so, uh, you know, that's not, uh, um, that doesn't preclude the use of trees. They grow there, but uh, it may adjust how I plant and what kind of implements I can use. You're going to want to figure out if you have good drainage. Some of this can be figured out on a soil map, and they tend to be pretty accurate for drainage. Uh, erosion problems that you might have to deal with. Thank God this isn't my field. <laughs> <coughs> And then the topography, this is a topo map, a topographic map, uh, which can be pretty useful if you're planning on some of the uh, you know, water capture stuff like swales or key lines. I tend to find that the topographic maps that are available are not uh, a small enough scale for me to use for farm planning. Um, so I don't tend to use them because even if you get a topo map, like I can look at this now, this is my farm, the same kind of image we've been seeing. but. Um, I can, tell from, I can tell you from experience that, the, the, that on the ground it's uh, slightly different and you're going to end up having to measure the slope and map out stuff if you want to do those kinds of earthworks anyway. Um, one kind of useful thing, just to get an idea of what the slope in your field is, is they have apps that are um, an inclinometer, <coughs> inclinometer. You can make one out of a you know, paper and a, a string, but I wanted to just show you. <coughs> right? These are just like the thing, it's a free app. Um, people use them for like leveling picture frames on the wall, right? And you have to have the gyroscope enabled phone. This is like the $50 Amazon phone, so it doesn't have to be super awesome. And what you can do is like, if you just uh, stand there and match the line of your phone with kind of the, you know, slope there. I've got a, about, this field, um, varies from about 9 to 12% slope. So that's a quick and dirty. You can also look down the line of your phone, or you could probably like tape something to it to make it more accurate and have somebody else read the measurement. Um, kind of easy way to do that. And the slope's going to be important when you start to figure out whether you want to do things on contour or what kind of machinery you're going to use. I can tell you that if you're, if you're driving a tractor uh, on this slope and you're not careful, you can, you can flip the tractor. This is uh, England's Orchard. Uh, um, Clifford is not too far from me in Kentucky. He's got a pretty, pretty serious slope on some of his fields and he's been growing stuff there for a long time. So it doesn't mean you can't use it. It just means you might have to manage things a little differently. <coughs> so aspect is another um, part of the puzzle. This is which direction your slope faces. Um, and I'm not going to, uh, I guess, belabor this point, but basically south slopes are drier and warmer, north slopes are cooler and wetter. If you have uh, a tree that is frost sensitive, you're going to want to put it in the cooler northern slope if you can. I know a lot of us have no choice on what, what slopes you get. Um, and you know, just realize that if you have stuff on south, south facing slopes, they're going to get they are going to stay warmer, but they're also going to be drier. And then you're going to want to figure out what existing vegetation is there, both to kind of get an idea of, hey, well, this grows here pretty well. Maybe I can use that kind of as an indicator for what should grow well. So um, I've got a bunch of elderberry in one of my bottom areas that floods every year. It's great soil. It has good drainage when it's not underwater. It doesn't <laughs> stay underwater very long, you know, six hours, 12 hours. Um, and there are a bunch of elderberry, wild well, elderberry growing there already, so, um, so I'm going to put a bunch more in. But you also want to figure out what weeds you have. So yesterday I talked about mulching as a way to suppress weeds. If you've got perennial weeds, you need to figure out what they are and how to get rid of them, especially if you are not planning on using herbicides. Because oftentimes organic control for weeds uh, is specific to the species of weed, what you need to do. There are weeds that if you decide to till, 
um, you're going to chop them into tiny pieces, and every little piece is going to sprout a new weed. And um, so figuring out what weeds you have is a good idea. Does anybody know this one? Jimson. Jimson weed, the tura, yeah. Poisonous. Well, yeah, to livestock and people. Evil is a good word for that. Evil, yeah. So annual seed can live for 50 years in the ground. Um, okay, so in your sheets you have kind of a copy of a site evaluation page at the end of chapter 2, I think. It just looks like this. And basically it's a spot to put down all this stuff that we've been talking about, all your observations. Um, there's some other stuff on here that I didn't really hit, but it's kind of self-explanatory. You're going to want to do one of these sheets for each, each field or each part of your field that's different. Um, you guys that have 500 acres and a square that's flat and one soil type, um, I'm sorry, that must be really boring. <laughs> Front and back, and um, anyway, it's there for you to use. Questions at this point? Do you know how often the soil sites are updated? Uh, they're not updated very often, but they tend to be fairly accurate. So it doesn't matter to it? Um, I mean, in my experience, and I, there are people here that know way more about the soil stuff than I do, but... Um, not about the soil type so much as there's a lot of other interesting information that's more climate related on the soil mm -hmm. page, and I just wondered yeah. if it's not um, updated regularly, if that's pertinent. I, you, it'll tell you when it was updated in the, in the, you can go into the metadata on soil web or web soil survey and it'll tell you. I think they just finished a new yeah. survey. And when you're looking at the soil maps and the soil types, sometimes they'll distinguish between a soil type heavily eroded historically. Mm. So just the, if it's only the soil type, that only tells you so much. It has a, yeah. That's folded right into the nomenclature. Right. It is an Iowa way. Yeah. It is for the whole U.S. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well. yeah. And, and with the flooding, and this is this a fairly major distinction too, with flooding, it matters a lot. Well, you, you alluded to the distinction between spring flooding for a few hours and flooding at other times of year because yeah. there's a lot of trees that can take spring flooding. Yeah, good. But there's a lot of trees that a midsummer flood yeah. will kill them in you know, two days of loss. Yeah. So th that's an important distinction. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because I didn't alliterate that. Yeah. Um, well drained and flooding frequency are not the same thing at all. Um, Mine flood in the winter. Oxygenated though. water flowing through, yeah. and ponded water that stays and gets stained. That's what different trees can tolerate. Different trees. And I, I found the soil maps to be pretty accurate for that. The one thing that they're not great on is it'll say you know 25 to 50 percent slope because they can't they can't do that on a soil map. So you're gonna have to figure that out on your own. Um, unfortunately, I don't have time to go into the, the trees each tree species. <clears throat> um, but you do have some profiles. We, I, I chose to put things in here that have either, you know, we, we, we've been doing a lot of, a lot of people have been successful at. There were things I chose not to put in the guide on purpose because they're challenging or there aren't proven uh, methods. I'm going to let you work through some of these. But at this point, what you do, once you have your site map, is kind of, you know, familiar, familiarize yourself with the crops that, that could grow there and just kind of try to make matches. and. I would say keep an open mind at this point. Um, try to figure out what grows there first, and then you can weed, you know, weed it down into through the filters of your own uh, goals and um, you know livestock that you would like to use. <coughs> right. And we'll talk about the trees that I chose for this site. Just could, could I enter the tree and shrub? Deciding, looking around at, at homesteads, abandoned and otherwise, in your country neighborhood and in the in the towns that are close to where you live, and see what grows. That yeah. goes a long ways to what would grow or not. Yeah, yeah, and I mean it, it's you got to be a little careful because you know I've got some trees growing on my site. Like I've got some some good black walnut and stuff. Just because something's growing there doesn't mean it's going to like thrive there, but it can be a, a, a place to start. Some things might be growing there and they're just languishing along and you probably should put something out. But if they're doing well. 
I'm going to talk a little bit about livestock. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it because there could be conferences and on all this stuff. And again, people are more qualified to talk about it than I am. But there are some decisions that if you plan on incorporating livestock, you should be thinking about in the planning stage. So ruminants, uh, sheep, cattle, goats, they eat grass. We don't really need trees to feed them. Uh, we, we've got good sustainable ways, rotational grazing, to feed these guys. Uh, what they benefit from is shade, and um, sometimes you can plan you know, systems where you're actually feeding them the tree leaves and, and as fodder or something. Um, I'm a big fan of silvopasture. I think it's got a lot of potential where I am in Kentucky. We need shade. Um, so this is a good, it's a focus of mine, but uh, it's not very specific to trees, um, except for a few. Honey locust is one that we're pretty excited about, and uh, obviously we have this honey locust contest with the Savannah Institute. Sheep are probably the best fit for honey locust, um, and if you're not familiar with honey locust, it's got those massive big thorns on it in the wild uh, that will pop your tractor tires. And, um, but it can be bred or grafted so that it doesn't have thorns. It has this really nice big pods on them that have, the reason they're called honey locusts is it's got this uh, sort of sugary goo inside that's really tasty um, for people and for livestock, and it's very high carbohydrates. The seeds also have quite a bit of protein, and um, it can be highly productive in, in uh, the improved varieties. Sheep are probably the best way to utilize it because they can actually mostly digest the seeds. Cattle cannot. Uh, nothing else can as far as I understand it. The problem with honey locust is if you have all of the seed, all of the, the improved varieties that we have now are thorny phenotypes. They make thorns from seed. You have to graft them to get them to be thornless. So even if all of your trees are grafted and you don't have thorns, when the seeds spread to your neighbor, all of them are going to sprout up with tractor tire popping thorns. And so that's one of the main focuses of our, of our uh, contest is to try to identify and possibly breed a thornless, highly productive honey locust. But sheep eat the seeds, so uh, you can grind, pick them up and, and grind it as part of a mixed ration. Nutritionally, they're about equivalent to oats, and in a good variety and spread across their biennial bearing habit, they have a yield almost similar to oats per acre, and that's above and beyond any grass that grows underneath them. Okay, uh, cattle, briefly, we love cows, they're great. Um, you're going to have to figure out how to handle them safely uh, on your farm. So I, I'm a, I'm, I keep sheep on my farm. I kept sheep on my farm. Um, I've, I've worked with cattle. But, uh, you know, I can throw a sheep and it won't kill me, right? Um, I can deal with the biggest sheep and um, it's not a problem. Cattle are a different story. You've got to have a good handling facility to do it safely. Or you can do mobile setups, but just be aware that it's going to take extra uh, infrastructure. So goats are a menace. <coughs> They're the cutest babies on the farm. And I, I can say that because I've had goats. Um, in my opinion, they're best used for cleaning up invasive species in woods that are in bad shape. They're not a great fit for fruit and nut trees. Um, you know, the old saying that the goats spend 23 hours of the day planning their escape and the last hour executing it is pretty accurate. This is an appropriate goat pen. Actually, no, I, uh, that's not electrified, so they'd probably, they'd probably get out of that, too. Uh, my, my advice is, uh, from, multiple, from my own experience and from multiple uh, other anecdotal experiences, um, keep them away from your high-value fruit nut trees. If you have successfully integrated goats, I'd like to talk to you. OK, poultry, um, again, are a great species, especially early on. Uh, they've got a quick turnaround. They can generate income. We've heard, uh, you know, from panels and other folks already about the awesome potential of poultry. Uh, Non-ruminants. Let me back up a little bit. Non-ruminants like poultry, hogs. Um, bees are non-ruminants, but um, <laughs> they need more than just grass. They they can't meet all of their energy needs from grass alone. They benefit a lot from from grazing. They can get a lot of the protein that they need. Uh, minerals, the improves the meat quality and all that, but they have to have an energy source more than grass. And so this is where we can start to plant trees that actually drop fruits or nuts that would be a benefit to the livestock. 
Uh, chickens have the potential to be used uh, also for pest control, chickens and hogs. Some of the evidence of, of running chickens through orchards does show that the number of pests decreases. Some of the studies show that it doesn't actually affect the fruit quality. Um, there are other benefits to having them in, in, you know, say an apple orchard. In chestnut orchards, uh, again, some anecdotal evidence that they'd be able to help with chestnut weevils, if that's a, a, a deal in your area. And uh, trees like mulberries. Chickens can eat mulberries off the ground with no processing. Uh, turkeys are another uh, poultry option. I don't have a lot of experience with turkeys, but um, you know, I'm told that they can they can eat more things than than chickens can, like chestnuts. Maybe chinkapins. That's an interesting uh, idea to plant some native chinkapins and let the turkeys eat them. I know wild turkeys will. And then uh, hogs have a, a lot of great potential for integrating into tree-based systems. They dig. If you leave them in one, spa in one spot too long, you're going to end up with holes. They like to dig wallows. They dig because they're bored. They dig up roots to eat on them. So if you're planning to have pigs, you need to have a pretty good system and a pretty good idea of when you're going to move them, how you're going to move them. You know, if you're going to have a sacrifice area where you've got a waterer and a wallow and uh, their shelter, be thinking about how you're not going to destroy your trees with pigs. If they're not bored, if, you, if, they, if there's lots on the ground for them to eat and you move them quick, then they can be a really useful tool. Some of the useful species, and this is where J. Russell Smith has got some really awesome stuff. Um, I've got a copy of his book out there. This is the tree crops fellow from uh, originally 1930s, revised in 1950. Um, kind of foundational text for a lot of what we are excited about and do. Mulberries, persimmons, chestnuts, hazelnuts, apples, these all have potential for pigs and more. Uh, they have done studies where when they run pigs through a, an apple or pear orchard after the fruit has been harvested and all the rotten fruits on the ground, the pigs will clean up 100% of the fruit and it will break the pest cycles for the next year. Uh, especially things like plum, plum curculio and these uh, you know, pests, that, that their life cycle takes place in the fallen fruit and in the soil. And then bees uh, are livestock, and they're worth considering. I'm a beekeeper. Everybody should keep bees. They're awesome. That's all I'm going to say about it. <laughs> Good for pollination, too, obviously, uh, but that's a whole different talk. OK, so just to finish up with livestock, there are certain things they need that your trees will not need. They've got to have daily water. You've got to check on them every day. They've got to have good shelter, obviously. So. If you've got super sloped pastures and you're trying to do chickens, like think about how you're going to move those pins through the field, or um, how you know if you want to walk up and down a hundred foot tall hill every day. How are you going to handle them? Even things like birds. What are you going to do when you harvest them? These are crates for hauling chickens to the processor. Do you have access? Can you get the trailer to where the chickens are? And then what your fence is going to be. And I talk a lot about fencing in the second part of the book and how to decide if what kind of fence, you know, fence versus tree tube, some of that stuff. This is one of the graphs that we came up with for the book because this is, when I was starting to do this stuff, that was a huge question, especially for deer. You know, do I put up a deer fence? Do I tube every tree? And so we crunched some numbers and, um, and it, the answer is, of course, it depends. It depends on the size of your acreage. It depends on um, what existing fence is there and how many trees you have per acre. But this is kind of a um, quick and dirty, you know, acres across the bottom. So my field's two and a half acres that we're looking at now. And if you go up, the first thing you hit is the cheapest option. Uh, so this is 50 tubes per acre. So if I only have 50 trees, that's the cheapest. The next is a 3D electric fence uh, for deer. Um, and so on. You have to crunch those numbers yourself too, though. That, you know. Oh, right, that's out of sequence. But bees are awesome. <laughs> They're still awesome. They're still <laughs> super awesome. <laughs> um, I could talk about bees all day long. Questions at this point? I feel like I'm roaring through this. It's good. Okay, so it may seem kind of weird to think about harvest in the planning stages, but you need to know how you're going to get this stuff harvested before you put a tree in the ground, because it's going to affect how far apart you put things, where you put things, 
Um, how you can harvest it will depend on your slope and all that. Um, labor. Obviously, labor is one of the biggest, uh, harvest labor is one of the biggest inputs for tree-based systems. And so you're going to want to think pretty, pretty, uh, you're going to want to do some pretty good thinking about how you're going to hire labor if you're going to be able to keep it within your family. You know, this is part of your goals. Uh, goals that you have. Do you want to have a bunch of employees at, for two weeks, you know, or do you want to be able to keep it manageable for you and your family? Uh, this this chart is um, basically just shows that you can, as you incorporate different species, they have different species of, of fruit and nut trees, um, they have different harvest periods. So if you want to keep it in your family and you kind of want to spread things out, this is a, diversifying is a great way to do that. Um, so this is kind of the harvest period for these crops um, where I am. And you know, a, an estimate of what the harvest period in days would be. This is the harvest labor per acre. And these are estimates. It's going to be a little bit different. But you know, I put this up here just to show that they vary widely. You know, handling a couple of acres of chestnuts by hand is no problem for one person. You are not going to handle two acres of black currants by hand with one person. Um, it's it's just not um, it's not going to work. So this is on the I've got another slide um, on the right here. We just kind of did some quick and dirty calculations of like how many acres one person can handle over that harvest period. So doing some of this yourself uh, might be useful as you think about labor. It's also good to know what the labor peak is in your country neighborhood. Yeah. Because you might think, oh, there's plenty of Amish kids around, they'll come over that week, and right. it turns out that's the same week the thresholds. Sure. And you're out, so. That's a great thought. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we do, we still do quite a bit of tobacco in my area, and people cannot find folks to, to cut tobacco. There's just, people aren't willing to do it, and those that are willing to work hard are already busy during that time of year. So that's a great, that's a great thought. Thank you. If you do plan on using machine uh, harvest, you need to figure out if the machine will actually fit on your land and if it can handle the slope. Most of the harvest equipment is designed for flat bare ground, not all of it. What's he smoking? Uh, he's smoking hazelnuts here. Uh, this is a backpack harvester, so Europe has a lot more awesome options for harvest technology than we do. Uh, this thing is supposedly can suck up chestnuts and hazelnuts. And costs about a thousand bucks. Imported, already like paid. Um, some, some, some of the smaller harvesting equipment can handle a slope, uh, but you'll have to check with the manufacturers of, of what you're interested in to make sure. How many acres are you going to need to pay for this machine? And we don't have time to go into like a machinery budget, but. There are going to be a, a minimum number of acres you're going to want to run this thing through to actually pay for itself. The more acres you can harvest with the machine over the season, the less per acre overhead your costs are going to be, right? Um, there's real potential here for machinery sharing and cooperatives. Um, this, this particular machine here, uh, the Joanna, can harvest uh, currants, aronia, um, saskatoons, hascaps, uh, and you know, runs anywhere from thirty to sixty thousand dollars, depending on what the options are. And that's another really awesome. Um, and I don't think I, unfortunately, put that in there. This is another awesome opportunity to diversify and spread your season out, so you can run that machine more. Um, you know, if you if you have a, a two or three week current season, and you have a machine that can harvest currants, that machine's only going to be operating for two or three weeks a year. But if you add two or three other berry crops and now you have a six week harvest season, you've just doubled uh, the amount of time that that machine can run in a year and basically you'll be able to pay it off two, uh, twice as fast, right? It's not quite as simple as that, but the basic idea. And then I'm super interested in crops that can, or machines that can harvest multiple crops. So we've got all these awesome little sweepers and vacuums and stuff in Europe that they've had forever that can, basically if it falls on the ground, they can sweep it up and put it into a bin. They use it a lot for cider apples, um, for pears, for making perry. So in Europe, they do cider differently. They have bigger trees, um, traditionally. They shake the apples out of the trees and then they sweep them up. What's that 
This is um, uh, Fert, Obst, didn't it? And I have the, the company stuff. There's actually, um, uh, there's a little blip in here about that, that actual machine. What's it picking up? Yeah, what's he These are up? apples. Well, there aren't any trees. No, he's dumping it. Yeah, I just wanted oh, to show okay. the, yeah. So they basically have a sweeper that um, sort of flops everything into the middle and then a pickup uh, in, in the machine that you're driving and it can either uh, plop it into a bin that you can dump or it can put it into you know, like a 40 liter tote or an apple bin. And um, these guys run I think about 30 grand. They have all the way down to a walk behind unit um, and all the way up to something you mount on your tractor. So there are some pretty awesome options. This, this particular manufacturer said that it could sweep up apples, pears, walnuts, chestnuts. Um, it would sweep up the burrs with the chestnuts, so you'd have to figure that out. And uh, hazelnuts if your grass is, is cut low enough. There's another trade-off here, because if you pick them up by hand, you're sort. That's you're true. You've got to sort afterwards. That's true. And with the berry picking machine, your pruning and your spacing and your weed control has to be good enough so that the machine can accommodate it, whereas right. if, you're, if you're not. So even though the machine saves a lot of labor in one part, there might be, you got to think about the trade-off of what it takes to, to make the site adaptable to a machine. Yeah, and you're absolutely might, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and there's a little bit of that discussion on some of the other types of machines. Um, you know, folks are using like pecan harvesters for, for sweeping up chestnuts and you know, they don't get all the chestnuts and they end up with 30 chestnuts and you got to hand sort them later as opposed to picking them up with a, you know, nut wizard or a by hand. And where this is leading to is you got to figure out where your labor, where your labor bottleneck is. Right. Cuz you can only manage as much as your bottleneck. Sure. Other input? I wanted to add something. Sure. In the multi cropping, something that Eric and maybe you even contributed to that. Yeah, a little bit. One of the things I thought was so helpful, having not yet done any of this myself, was scales of things per product that you could do by hand. And to know if you have more than two acres of this, you cannot. You know, those are the types of things that are extremely helpful when you just like the idea of having lots of things and want to put a lot right. of things in the ground. Right. So, did you say that that's in here as well? Yeah. Briefly, yeah. Um, she's talking about, um, thank you. Basically, the, the number of acres that a person can handle or the, the number of, um, of, of, the amount of labor it would take to handle certain, certain crops. Um, we have for each species in here, and what is not included in here and uh, is still kind of, we're working with the designer, we have a, a detailed sort of species matrix that um, has all of the data for each species that we have in the guide, and it's broken down into, you know, yield, season, hours per acre, all that stuff. Do you have somewhere uh, like plants per acre on those numbers? Yeah, yeah, that's in it too. Typical planting, spacing, all that stuff. Um, and I should have, I should have included this. Okay, so processing. Depending on your crop, you're going to have to do something with it or not before you sell it. <coughs> and this is something you should think about before you ever put it in the ground, um, because it's different for each species. I'm not really going to get into detail, but you're going to want to think about how you're going to. Uh, sell it and therefore how much you need you know if if the whole if you want to enter the wholesale market and the wholesale market says we need a semi load you're going to have to figure out how to grow that um, if you want to sell at a farmers market and you have a semi load you're not going to be able to sell it all um, are you planning on doing value added do you like coming up with wines and syrups and stuff do you want to sell to the public uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that in goals but um, what are you going to do with it Along with that is any processing or cleaning that you have to do. Um, you know, if you've got chestnut weevil, for example, in your area, you're going to have to do a hot water bath uh, and then keep it refrigerated. 
before you sell it. If you sell, it, we have weevils in our area, and um, you know, you pick up a nice bucket full of chestnuts and sit it on a glass bowl on the counter, and you come out the the next day and look in the bottom of that bowl, and half the people would faint for the chet, the weevils you'd see crawling around under there. Um, so, know what you've got to do to process it to get it to folks, and then just think about the regulations. If you know, HACCP, GAP, these are the kind of um, food safety handling plans that um, may be required by the folks that you're selling to and may be coming down the pipe um, in the future for everybody to have to do. Do you need a commercial kitchen to do what you need to do? And obviously, if you're making alcohol, there are definite, definite uh, guidelines for that. OK. I put goals here after. We've kind of worked through some of the other things because I feel like you have to be familiar with some of the possibilities before you can filter it through what you really want to do. Um, so there are multiple frameworks for kind of taking a, a step back and looking at, at the system as a whole. And I highly recommend picking one of them or several of them and working through it. And these are whole workshops in themselves too. But um, you know, whole farm planning, holistic management, the permaculture framework, um, whatever kind of resonates with you, please take a hold of it and work through it. Because clearly uh, stating what your goals are and what you like and what you don't like and um, you know, what your land can, can um, handle and what your family goals are is a really important part of things. And like, you know, personally, I, th I kind of think, oh, like, I just want to grow stuff. But it doesn't work that way. You have to figure that stuff out. So as part of that, and those frameworks are kind of a, their own deal, but I'm just going to talk about some of the points that maybe thinking about uh, now would be useful for. How are you going to market your things? Some people love sitting at a, I love sitting at farmer's markets and like talking to people and, oh, hey, how are you doing? And, um, but not everybody wants to set up a, and tear down a farmer's market every week. It takes a lot of time. You know, a lot of farmers just want to grow stuff. They don't want to deal with people. I just want to stick it on a truck and send it away and get a check in the mail. So figure out which kind of person you are. You typically get more money per unit of product if you sell directly to the public, but, um, but you don't have to deal with the public, the public if you sell wholesale. <laughs> what is your chemical strategy? Are you comfortable using herbicides and pesticides? There are crops that are very difficult to grow in certain places if you're an organic farmer. Um, so that's going to filter what you might be successful with or you might be comfortable with uh, applying. And there's a whole spectrum there. And I'm not judging anybody for what they decide. Uh, what's, your, what's your take on fossil fuels? You know, are you going to try to incorporate technology or ideas that maybe take a little bit more upfront cost but will pay off later by not having to use as much fossil fuel? This, you know, it's, it's hard to make diesel, right? Like, so, um, but other things like heating your, your, your spaces with wood or biomass or solar or, uh, are choices. And then again, we talked about labor. Um, what is your labor worth? Farmers don't value their labor enough. So figure out what you need to get paid and don't, don't say, oh, it's just my labor. I don't have to account for that. Um, doing detailed labor studies is really useful. Carry a little notebook or get an app where you can keep track of how long it takes you to do stuff. That's going to allow you to improve your operation. <coughs> Equipment is another thing. I hate working on tractors. I hate tractors in general. I did it for years. Um, I have a BCS. That's all I've got for my farm. I love the fact that when I had a Mitsubishi Mighty Max, I could drive the BCS tractor into the back and close the shell. And um, you know, when I wanted to work on it, I could drive it up onto the workbench. Um, it doesn't work for everything, right? Like obviously, you need more equipment for bigger operations. So figure out what you're comfortable working on. Figure out what you're comfortable paying to fix, because it will break and it will cost money. Um, if you have people around you that are willing to let you borrow or rent their stuff, uh, that can be a really good resource. So there's hiring work out. Big fan. Machinery work is yeah. so much simpler. Yeah. I didn't grow up with a wrench in my hand like a lot of people did. Right. I, I hire my mowing. Every other year I mow my two orchards. Yeah. 
you know, several times a year, and I do it every other year, but I just have somebody come and do it. Yeah. Less than what I could keep the rust off the And, floor. you know, the rest of the world kind of runs that way for ag, you know. They don't, they let people specialize and then come do the stuff they need to do. They don't have to own all the machines. We have this kind of weird idea that like farming means you have this big machinery shed and all this stuff rusting. But if you love it, if you love machinery management, that's totally Yeah, different. and then, you know, you can do the custom harvesting and make money on the side. So figure out what kind of person you are. Infrastructure, how are you going to do that processing? You know, this is a mobile packing, or a, not a mobile, but a sort of a more portable uh, packing shed. Um, you don't have to have, you know, uh, um, super, what am I trying to say? Think about infrastructure that can be easily assembled and disassembled, especially if you're doing, uh, you know, leasing or something like that. This is for a little urban farm, but um, same, same principles apply. And then owning land. You know, I, we talked a lot about long-term leasing and versus owning land. You know, you might be the kind of person that says, I want to have a piece of ground that I can hand on to my kids because I have no idea what's going on in the world and that just is something that's really important to me. Or you can say, um, I don't want to have a mortgage. I would prefer not to, you know, be in debt and I'm going to do a long-term lease with somebody. There's no wrong answer, but um, depends on what your goals are. And then access to capital. You know, are you the kind of person that wants to save up stuff? and pay for it up front? Are you comfortable with debt? Um, are you a do-it-yourselfer? Do you want to spend a bunch of money on plants because you don't want to learn how to graft and you don't want to spend a couple years growing trees or, or do you want to just get it in the ground and you're willing to, to pay for it? Stuff to think about. Questions at this point? We're almost there. Okay, so once you've done all this stuff, you get to do the fun bits, which is put it all together into a, a, a workable plan. <coughs> so you've kind of decided what your, what your trees are going to be, you know your site, now you've got to figure out how to put it together. You're going to have to consider some interactions that happen. Light is one of the big ones. <coughs> Excuse me. We love currants because they grow in the shade. They actually produce one of the only fruits that produce in the shade. We've got um, uh, one of the students in our lab who's doing shade trials for black currants and he found that 50% shade and full sun they yielded exactly the same amount of fruit hmm. and it was actually higher quality in the shade. If you go to 70 though yields go down. So we like putting currants under trees or in rows. Uh, most things can't handle that but something to think about. Uh, nutrients. Uh, plants compete with each other so if you have trees next to each other you're, um, you know, they're gonna, there's going to be some competition going on uh, there's an opportunity to use legumes here, you know, leguminous trees or a legume that is um, in the alleyways and, I, you know, I, I'm sure most of you know what, uh, legumes are trees that fix nitrogen from the air, right? Nitrogen is the most limiting nutrient in most agricultural landscapes, so people are doing some really interesting stuff where they're planting an apple and a pear and then a thornless honey locust and then an apple and a pear and a thornless honey locust or um, there have been studies of where they in incorporate black locusts with walnut and stuff and those trees as they as they fix nitrogen and you can manage them in ways like with coppicing or cutting them back where they slough off organic matter and make those nutrients available. Um, Question, have you had any studies that show that honey locust does fix nitrogen? The great honey locust nitrogen debate. It's a non-nodulating legume. I think the current uh, thinking is it does fix nitrogen. It's not nearly as much as something like a black locust or one of the, uh, you know, alfalfa or some of those things. But um, and somebody can probably knows more about it than I do. But that's when I tried to track it down. That's where I got that it doesn't it doesn't nodulate. So these are the the. the um, these little knobs on the roots that house the nitrogen fixing bacteria. This is a symbiotic relationship, right? Plants give them sugars and they uh, fix nitrogen. Um, good question. There's a guy in Canada, um, the, perma, um, the Miracle Farm. If you've seen, he's got a really neat video out of, of uh, an orchard that that's how he manages it. And um, it works for him. So. Yeah, I was going to ask you a research question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There have been studies with black locusts and walnut um, that have shown 
pretty awesome uh, increases in growth for the black walnut. There have been other studies that showed they competed. Um, in that same study that I'm thinking about, actually the winner was autumn olive, um, but don't plant it. What, 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 what did it win? It, it made the walnuts next to it grow twice as tall, twice as fast. Yeah, it partially depends on soil type, but studies showed that in ideal soil for black walnut, there was no advantage to plant okay. in sort of mid-lane soil uh, for black walnut, it was virtually 400 percent increase in vertical growth. Yeah, yeah. Walnut, so. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of opportunity and, and thinking about where the fertility long term is coming from in your systems is really awesome. Uh, root pruning is something that is recommended if you're alley cropping. Uh, you know, um, key line plowing is a similar technique that you can use for pruning tree roots. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but basically you rip the, the, the root line uh, on either side of the trees and it keeps the tree roots from getting into the alleys and competing with your, with your alley crop forces the tree roots to go down. Um, and then pollination, I shouldn't have put bees up here because what I'm talking about really is the species that you've chosen, you need to make sure that you have it arranged in a way that they're going to pollinate each other well. And it can be really simple for some things because they're self-pollinating and really complicated for other things like hazelnuts where they've got all these crazy alleles you have to keep track of and you have to plant specific varieties to pollinate others and or um, you know just do all seed. And, um, and then you're going to want to think about harvest dates. And I'm running out of time, but um, this is something that's a really important point that I think is worth thinking about carefully. If you plant all seedling rootstock, and the, 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 the seedling versus clonally propagated uh, question is a really good one to think about. Um, you know, there are advantages and disadvantages to both. But if you have seed, the, the harvest date is going to vary because you're, you're going to have a, a bunch of different genetics there, which is really great uh, for some things. But if you have a large planting, you're going to want to know when things are ready and when, especially if you're moving something like pigs through. If you have, if you're 10 acres or, of orchard, you know, if you've got chestnuts or hazelnuts and they're all seedling propagated, um, there are going to be trees all over that orchard dropping at different time, dropping their nuts at different time of the year. You're not going to be able to move your livestock through there in an efficient way um, or harvest as efficiently as if they are in blocks by harvest date, which you can do if you've clonally propagated by grafting. Something to keep in mind. And then just succession. Early on, um, you know, mid-succession, late. So, you know, this is an alley cropping example where corn is a pretty decent um, alley crop early on. Once it starts to get shaded out, you can put something in like winter wheat, which has kind of an opposite um, season as most trees. And then once it's too shaded to do wheat, you plant pasture and have silver pasture. So thinking about the short, medium, and long term is also important. Um, this is just spacing of the tree. So uh, a lot of you know, folks will plant things like chestnuts or hazelnuts at double density and then thin later on and maybe do another thinning. So this is the same deal over time. And it allows you to get more yields early on, but um, you end up having to thin. So there's some trade-offs and benefits there. The spacing between your rows. Uh, I recommend using your equipment width as one of the indicators to figure that out, especially if you're doing alley cropping and you've got, you know, a 30-foot uh, planter for corn or something. Like, make it a multiple of 30, right? Uh, tree size plays a part in this, and then whatever your grazing plans are, too. Okay, and then last, this is the part where you actually stick the stuff on a piece of paper. You can actually do this on paper. Uh, the, the thing to keep in mind is that the, the bigger piece of paper you have, the better, and you're going to have to make sure that you're at scale, right? So um, if you just print something off the Internet and start drawing circles on it, it's not going to be the right scale for that map, right? So you either have to figure out what scale your map is, or you can actually look at the scale bar on your printed map. So this is just Google Earth. You can get a, a ruler out and say, okay, for 200 feet, I add 1.3 inches and do the math, and then you figure out what your scale is. And you can do a little you know, cardboard cutouts of a 30-foot wide chestnut or whatever and plop them down and trace.
It's possible. Um, you can also do Google Earth. It's not as easy to do. It does spatial layout, but you can't do individual trees as well. You can do rows fairly easily in Google Earth. Um, but my, my um, go-to is SketchUp. It's a free software. Uh, how many of you have used SketchUp? Cool. Um, it, there's a little bit of a learning curve, but there's a good community for it. And um, that's my last slide. Five minutes? I just wanted to show you what, what SketchUp can do. Yeah. Real quick. So this is the same thing. Um, like I said, it's a free download. They have a pro version that you can pay more for, but um, the, the, the basic version is actually pretty powerful. And once you get a hang of it, you can actually come up with a design a much quicker. And it is the scale. In SketchUp, if you you know, you start with nothing. You can go to this geolocation tab, and I've already added it here, but you can say add imagery. And you type in an address, and it pops up a map, and then you crop it and say import. And so now you've got your aerial photograph that is to scale in, in a software that you can work with. And so if I, um, it does even have like a terrain. So the terrain is not terribly accurate, but um, it's an interesting feature anyway. Uh, so it'll make it, the topography match whatever to, uh, topographic map they have. But say I want to, you know, plan, plant some trees, right? I do a circle. What, what kind of tree should we make it? Oak. Oak. Okay. <laughs> How big is an oak tree? It's a bur oak. 100 feet. Big one. Sure. All right. So we. We draw a circle, we put 50 for our radius. There's our oak tree. 40 foot centers. Do you want to do 40 foot centers? Is that what this one That's the radius. So if the tree gets 100 feet wide, you just put the radius in. So you can adjust that right away. Um, and I know I'm going through this quick. This is not like bit, uh, supposed to be kind of a tutorial, but um, then I can, I can take it and say, OK, I want one next to it. How far away? 40 foot centers. 40 foot centers is going to be pretty tight. For not for that. Um, yeah, for, uh, for 100 foot trees. Let's put them 100 feet apart. And then if I want to make a line, I can say, OK, I want uh, 10 of them. And it's just going to make a line. And then you can copy that. OK, I want to. Um, <laughs> But um, yeah, and it's pretty powerful. So now I can say, okay, there's my row, and I want to move my row um, 50 feet this way. Um, sorry, that was 50. <laughs> that is 50 feet. Because okay, let's do 200 feet. So we're looking at maybe 12 trees. And I want, you know, five rows. Um, and then, so, you know, this is a quick and dirty. But what's really interesting then is I can click on one of these and go up here to edit. And right here it says I've got 111 of these in my model. So now I have my nursery count. Another little handy formula for that is 20, 20 foot centers is 200 per acre. And so if you go the math, either way it works. Right. Yeah, they've got great tables for that. Where you know they've got spacing on rows and spacing between trees, and you just find the. So I've, I've, you know, uh, one nice thing you can do is, is you know, outline your fields. This line here is a field. Um, sorry. Like your headlands or your buffers. Don't forget to put space to turn around. Right. Um, these are currents, and these are my trees. You know, I can zoom in on my spacing here. Um, and you can make really nice uh, print maps. You just export it as a, as a JPEG, and there, there's your two-scale map of what you got. So what I decided was uh, these big green trees are chestnuts. 
So I can click on one and go up here and say, okay, I've got, I've got 26 chestnuts. I decided to put a row of hazelnuts in between. And I've got 50 hazelnuts in my model. And then these guys are currants. And I've got 305. So not only do I have a map, I can print out and say, okay, this is all to scale. And of course, you can monkey around with it and figure it out. But then I have a nursery count of how many plants I need. Pretty powerful software. I can, um, I can think of a nuance that doesn't have. Yeah. On your thinner soils and your soft slopes, you can go to tighter spaces because there's more light and there's not as much vigorous growth. Yeah. And so you can, but whereas on a northeast slope with really good soils, you got to have a little bit more room between your plants to get the same light penetration. Right. So, yeah, I'm an old Luddite that's trying to criticize things. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, actually, what somebody needs to do, somebody who knows how to program, um, that could be done, right? So you can, you can, it's an open source um, extension. You can, it, um, the extensions are open source. So if you know Ruby, which is a programming language, you can, you can do awesome stuff in, in SketchUp. And somebody needs to build an agroforestry package for it. Um, SketchUp is really powerful when you're in straight lines on flat ground. If you try to do uh, contours, it gets complicated quick. Um, so just a caveat there. So somebody you know, needs to do it for you. Can you import other layers, like topographic maps and yeah. other layers? You yeah. 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 And this is a fully 3D software. I was just showing the overhead, but this is what you know designers, a lot of architects use for buildings and stuff. So you can integrate your greenhouse in your house, and um, you can actually scale it to a photograph. So if you have a picture of a building, there's a way that you can import the photo. Say, you know, this side is, is this um, length, and this side is this length, and then it'll scale it so now what you're building off of is the scale. I'm sure a couple of people know Jim Barmore. He's like about to start teaching classes about how to make 3D modeling uh, topographic maps using SketchUp and GIS technology. And then I don't know, he's not there yet with like a full design of the trees and everything, but if you're just looking to like learn how to do the 3D mapping and that, Jim Barmore. Um, the other thing I didn't mention about SketchUp is that there is an online community, so you can import other people's SketchUp designs. So, like I've, um, these are just circles on the ground because they're easy to, th easy to think about. But you can fully model a chestnut tree, and then upload it or uh, you know onto the web, and then anybody can download it. So, um, again, somebody needs to do a package where we've got all of our agroforestry trees in there. And everybody can download it, and they literally just drop right into your map, and you can do the same things where you multiply them and put them in lines and stuff. So it's time to have time to do it. But there might be somebody else in the room that could do that. Yeah, come let's talk. All right. So at the end of this process, you should have your site assessment sheet, which is that blank thing that you know to fill out. You've got your maps. You should have a list of suitable species for your site, both trees and livestock. You, you started to work through your, your goals and have a plan for that. You have a field layout, and then the last step is um, your nursery list, right? Or your wish list. That was, I felt like uh, I went through a week's worth of information in one hour. Are there any questions? I think we're going to do a quick break, and then Lee is going to talk about the economics. Uh, they're working on a really cool economic tool for this stuff, which is the just a perfect counterpart because that's not my game. So, thank you, Matt. Yeah, take a quick break. I'm happy to chat with folks. And uh, man, what's a BCS? Uh, it's a walk behind tractor. What does a BCS stand for? It's an Italian yeah. name. Oh, it's a brand. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's a brand okay. name. I've seen it. I've seen so it. Much Why are we so fascinated with locust pot? Just to see if we can yeah, grow yeah. some that don't throw thorn? Yes. Do you want me to gather the locust pods? I mean, I'm going to enter it in contest. But yeah. We got you have some? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Nice. Yeah. The, the, the Savannah Institute just wants them. Yeah. Well, I mean, we want the good, the good ones. So well, what makes them good? You don't know by looking in the pod whether the seeds are going to make thorns or not. No, but you know by you the tree they fall off. Oh, I definitely do. Yeah, it's one tree and they fall all around. It. Okay, thorns or not? 
on the offspring? No, no, the tree itself. The tree, this tree itself doesn't have them. Was it a yard tree or in the woods? Yes. Okay. So the, yeah, yeah, we'd be interested. Okay. Yeah. Short answer. <laughs> My district forester and my NRCS and district conservation could not find any way to get site connected information through the web soil survey. So okay. if you can show me that. Well, it has to be in the metadata. So if they've got it as part of this multi layer, you know, they will build a back to go. And then eventually it ends up out at this point. It's still not going to be a lot of work. But uh, I'm going to first of all, I'm going to turn it as much of the farm as possible to either sell the best or not. And right now, we're going to have to wait for the weekend. And we'll probably do it in the next couple of weeks. And we'll have to wait for the weekend. And we're going to have to wait for the weekend. So then if we get that, then we go to the perennial wheat. So that right now we don't produce